Good to be with you. Happy Easter. That was weak. Happy Easter. Okay, some of you excited to be here today? I can feel it. You want to be here. Um, you like Easter. You get Easter. Um, you're like, you're like we're going we're gonna to stick in the book of 1 Corinthians. Some of you, that like, doesn't mean anything to you, but for believers, that's where we're going we're gonna to land today. And uh, there's, a, there's a portion in 1 Corinthians 15 where the writer says this simple statement. He says, by the, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. He says, and that grace was not without effect. And so some of you understand that, that we are, we are here, we're celebrating, not religion. This is not a religious place. And so if you don't like religion, welcome to the club. This is about Jesus. This is about what he accomplished on the cross 2,000 years ago. Uh, this, is, this is about freedom. This is about grace. And that grace, uh, for many of us, has not been without effect, hopefully, right? That's why you're smiling today. That's why you didn't curse somebody out when you pulled into the parking lot today. It, it, it's, it's why you have joy in your life. It's why you're more patient. It's why you're more generous. The grace of God has not been without effect. Anybody else say amen to that? Amen. Okay. Others of you here today, uh, the only word I could think of, so I said some people are here to celebrate. Some people, and I hate to use this word because it's one of those words that as soon as you use it, it divides the room. The word comply, you know what I'm talking about? It's like one, it's like it's it's a, a political word, like, I will not comply, right? And so, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, well, you say woke, what? I'm woke? Am I, uh, 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 immigration, oh, right? And so it's like one of those, one, one of those words, social justice, oh, it's like those words, they just divide the room, right? And so even as I say the word comply, you're like, I will not comply, right? But the truth is, you, you're here because you're complying today. You're here because um, your parents made you. Let me just preach to the teenagers today. You had no choice, you're just here. Right? Your parents woke you up, say you're coming to church today, right? Maybe you're not a teenager, you're 26 years old, you should be out of your parents' house by now, but they woke you up, <laughs> and they said you're coming to church, right? And you're mad. You're like, you can't make me do it. I'm a grown-up. You're not a grown-up. You live at home with your parents. And so, right? And so, all right? And so you have, you have that. Maybe, maybe you were made to come by your spouse, or not made, but you know, you were made. Like, they, they stopped talking to you last week. They invited you to church. You said no. They haven't talked to you for a week. And finally, you're like, I'm not going to win this battle. And so I'm here today with my spouse just to keep them happy. Some of you, you got a grandparent that passed away, and their last dying wish was, just go to church on Christmas or Easter, right? And so you're here. And so, in case they are watching. And so, um, some of you were here because somebody invited you over and over and over again. And so you, you are here uh, because, in essence, you're, you're complying, but e even that, that word, you're like, I don't want to com comply. You know, you know another favorite, favorite word that people use now in, in, in the world that just has all, we don't even know what it means, but when you're talking about the world, you're talking about taxes, you're talking about bridge falling down, you're talking about all these things, you ever notice when you're talking, you're like, you're like they, right? You ever use that word when you're talking? Be like, they are trying to do this. My, my father-in-law was like, who was, who was they? He's like, I'm like, I don't know. It's just they. Like, they're just th them out there somewhere in a room somewhere, right? And just moving pieces around and th they. And I, I, even that, the, the word comply, like, I'm not going to comply uh, and, and, and I'm not going to believe this and I'm not going to be about this and I'm not a sheep, right? And I don't just come in here and blindly follow this whole Christianity thing. And I'm glad for that. I'm glad for that. Actually, I like that word they. Because that, that's a good word. Like, who are they? Who are the people that believe this garbage? Who are the people that actually come in here and smoke what you're about to sell? Like, who, who are the, the people that shared this message? What do they have to gain? You ever, like, some, some, sometimes I, I, I like to go back and think about, like, they in Scripture. Like, the they's that shared this message. Like, the very first person who sees Jesus uh, risen from the, from the dead is Mary Magdalene. So if you don't know who Mary Magdalene, we don't know a lot of her history. Uh, a lot of people think she was a prostitute at one point and Jesus changed her life. But what we do know about Mary Magdalene is at one point she was possessed by seven demons. Her life sucked. She, she, was, she was in a bad spot. The word seven in scripture implies complete. Like she, whatever happened to her to get her to be to that state, it was like, this is final. This is over. And then she meets Jesus at some point in the Gospels, and Jesus changes her life. And so we, we see her differently. That one of his disciples was Simon the Zealot, right? I like that. That's a cool, sounds cool, but well, here's what he wanted to do. He wanted to kill everybody. Like, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a complier. If there was ever a non-complier living in Tennessee somewhere, it was Simon the Zealot. Like, he would not comply. He wanted to kill the Roman government, and Jesus changes his life, and it leads him to a more peaceful means. Peter, a denier, right? Jesus, we, some people, we don't even know their names. One person just called the woman at the well, 
Jesus meets this woman who uh, she's living with her boyfriend and she's kind of in a scandalous situation because that wasn't normal at that time. And Jesus has this really direct conversation with her where she, she, he's basically like, hey, you've been doing this a lot. You've had a lot of husbands. They've just been your boyfriends. You've lived with them. We're in this cycle. Let's stop this and let's, go, let's do it my way. My way's better than, than your way. So he changes her life and she goes back to her, her city and she shares the gospel of Jesus. One of my favorite days is that uh, Jesus meets this dude. I, 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 I want to meet this dude in heaven one day. He meets this dude that is naked, um, uh, uh, he's, he's obsessed, or he, he's filled with a demon, he is uh, cutting himself, living in a cemetery, Jesus changes his life. So if you got clothes on today, well, you're good already, right? Like, right? Like, so you think about all these days that, that shared the scripture. My favorite day, my favorite day, because uh, uh, I always wonder that, like, what types of people go to church? My favorite day, what types of people share the message? My favorite day is where we're going to land today um, in scripture. His name is, at one point, was Saul. And then he started following Christ, and they changed his name to Paul. And so if you ever read the Bible, and you get to the New Testament, and you read through different passages of the New Testament, about 40% of the New Testament is written by this guy named Paul, but his original beginning in Scripture is Saul. So Jesus comes back from the dead and uh, appears to his disciples, and they begin to share the gospel message in the exact city where he died on the cross and came back from the dead. They share the gospel of, of Jesus in Jerusalem. And Saul is a religious leader that hates the message of Jesus. He just hates it. He doesn't want Jesus to come in and talk about grace. He loves rules. Anybody else a rule follower here? I don't, we don't like you. And so, uh, <laughs> like, yes, I follow the rules, right? And so, I don't like rules, right? And Paul loved rules. Like Saul, he loved rules. He wanted to follow rules. How many times am I supposed to pray? How many times am I supposed to go to the temple? What kind of sacrifices am I supposed to make? So Jesus comes and he ruins that. He's like, there's no more sacrifices. I'm the sacrifice. It's not about prayer, it's about relationship. You can pray when you need me. I can, I'll speak to you all the time. Like, we're going to have a relationship. It's not about tradition. It's about a new way of living. Like, like it, 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 it's, it's, it's different. And so Saul doesn't like that. So here's what Saul does. Saul starts to kill the Christians. This is literally how he starts. He's, he fir- the first thing you meet him in is he is uh, he's a part of a crowd that kills a man named Stephen. They stone him to death because he's following Jesus. Paul's there egging the crowd on, holding their jackets. Then he goes to the religious leaders, and he says, I like this. Send me on a mission to kill more Christians. He is a non-complier. He wants nothing to do with the gospel. On the way, the Bible says to Damascus, which maybe means nothing to you, but that was just the destination where he was going to go kill more Christians. The Bible says that Jesus, who's now risen and ascended to heaven, meets him in the middle of the road to Damascus and changes his life forever. He goes and spends time at a man's house, gets his thoughts together. God calls him into ministry, and he goes on to become the greatest missionary this world has ever known. And that guy is the guy I want to read, I want to read this passage. He, he wrote this. He writes to a church in Corinth, and I always love Corinth because Corinth reminds you of America, right? America, church is kind of crazy. You guys are crazy. Let's just be honest. There's a lot of, lot of like, maybe not this service. This is a 930 service, right? But the next service, they're going to amen that. They're going to be like, yes, right? Like the 930 service, this is all the proper service. Like, I get it. It's hard. Gospel's hard. We want you to move and clap. And I don't know what I'm supposed to do, right? And so, and so we're going to loosen you up by the end of this, hopefully. And so, um, but you got you to wake up. Everybody elbow your neighbor say, wake up, wake up. It's Easter, right? I got to do this three more times. I can't do this with you guys. And so I'll just stop. I'll just stop and save it for the next service. And so, um, and, and so Paul writes to this church in Corinth. They're, they're kind of they're wild. And uh, he writes this passage, and this is where I want to land in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And here's what he says. He's going to teach us the gospel. The gospel is the good news. He says, uh, now I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you have been saved. If you hold fast to this word, I preach, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered it to you as of first importance. This is the most important thing. It's weird. This is one of the only times we focus on the resurrection, the cross, the death. We, we tend to give it kind of passing service, but Paul says, this is it. This is all that matters. Like, this is what everything we do is built on. You don't have this. You don't have anything. Here's what he says. Here's the gospel. It's not religion. It's not I took my kid to get dedicated. It's not I'm a part of a Lutheran church or a Mennonite church or I have a plot of land where I'm going to get buried someday. That's religion. You ever talk to people about religion and hear the stuff they believe? It's crazy. It's not about putting your kid in confirmation class or whatever that is. It's not that. 
Here is the gospel. Ready for the gospel. Here's what it says. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with scripture. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with scripture. Here's what he goes on to do. He appears to Cephas, which is Peter. Then to the twelve. Then he appears to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most of whom at this time were still alive. Though some died or fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. As I was killing Christians, he appeared to me, from the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But the grace of God is what I am about now, and his grace towards me was not in vain. Do you see what he says? He says a couple things. These these are unarguable, by the way. This isn't a made-up story, and so it's not just in the Bible. Like, if you can study, you can study history. And so some of you are like, I don't, I don't believe in the Bible. I don't care what it says. Weird is written in a cave somewhere. And so I'm not going to believe that. And so, um, and so the Bible actually wasn't written like that. We could talk about that at some other point in time. Um, but there's outside, outside historians. You can, I'll just give you one. Josephus, he's not a believer. He's a Jewish historian that talks about Jesus dying on a cross. This, this is not an arguable thing. Like, G- Jesus at one point lived on this earth over 2,000 years ago. And at 33 years of age... They put him under trial, and they killed him. That's, 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 un, that's unarguable. That's not what makes him special, by the way. At that time, um, they did this all the time to people. The Romans were known to torture people through crucifixion. In fact, most, most theolo- or, or, or historians believe the Romans did this over 100,000 times to people. That if they wanted to punish you in the most cruel way they, they could, they would strip you absolutely naked. We don't see that most, oftentimes in pictures. And they would publicly display you in front of the place to make a mockery of you and to make a statement to other people. Don't mess with Rome. They would nail your hands and your ankles to, to, the, to the cross. And they would allow you to, to, to die a slow, painful death as people would walk by and spit on you. And birds would fly around you and peck at your eyes. Many times it would take days. You would hear screaming from, from your, your house of people getting crucified. This wasn't an a, a uncommon way to die. But this is not a made-up story. You can study history. Crucifixion was a part of Roman history. And absolutely Jesus, a man, a Jewish man, a carpenter, 33 years old, unmistakably, historically accurate, he came and he, he died. Some of you are like, how, 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 do you have more evidence of that? Well, you ever hear of a, a guy named Nero? You probably learned about him in, in, in school at some point. He's also in the Bible. He makes an appearance about 60 years after Jesus um, came back from the dead. That's what the Bible teaches. And uh, Nero is famous for two things. First thing he's famous for is uh, burning down Rome. <laughs> he, he, set, he set Rome on fire. Now, that's arguable, and he's not here to defend himself, and I don't want to get an email about judging people. And so we, we don't know that to be true, but more than likely, he burnt down Rome. And when he burnt down Rome, he used it as an opportunity to blame what, what at that time they called Christians. This is 60 years after Jesus died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross, and something happened as he died on the cross that turned people from running away from this and being ashamed and afraid to now being willing to to live for Jesus 60 years later. And here's what Nero did. You can read it in history. It's not just in the Bible. He found Christians, and he would put them on a stake. He would impale them, and he would light them on fire and use them for kindling to light up the Roman streets. This is historically accurate. Jesus died on a cross. The second thing that's historically accurate is uh, Jesus, Paul says, and we can all, this, they, they, they put his body in a tomb. They didn't hide him somewhere. Uh, it, they, they took his body. They put it in a, a tomb of a borrowed rich man. They wrapped him in cloth. They rolled a two, two to 4,000 pound stone in front of it. They sealed it with a Roman seal. They guarded it with Roman soldiers. They did everything they could to keep him dead. This is unarguable. This is not made up, right? Like, we don't walk through Valley Forge National Park and be like, I wonder if this actually happened. And you're like, yeah, it's easy to see. It's right there. I I, I get that. But you weren't there. Like, we do this with these things. Like, we, oh, yeah, that was there. But this is 100%. You can't argue this. Jesus came. He died on a cross. He was placed in a tomb. And here's what happened on the third day. They came to anoint his body. His followers had no no thoughts of resurrection. They were afraid. They thought it was over. The first two women came to anoint his body. That means they thought he was dead. And they came to that tomb that was supposed to be guarded by the Roman soldiers. 
And the, the, I love this part. The Roman soldiers, when, it, when the women got there, it says they were frozen, like in a death position on the ground. They were afraid. I never seen that, but I would love that, right? They're like, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, right? <laughs> And like, we don't know who rolled the stone away. They walk in, they, they, see, they see that the stone is, is gone. They see that the body of Jesus is gone. They go back, get the disciples. They come back, they peek in. They're like, where's Jesus at? They're still afraid. They're like, somebody stole Jesus' body. Here's the argument. Here's the argument. Okay, we can't argue if he died on, on the cross. We can't argue if he was placed in a tomb. The argument is, what happens next? What happens next? Because what they start to say is, Jesus, he came back from the dead because Jesus begins to appear to his disciples. He comes to Thomas, who doubts it, shows him the, he- the, the holes in his hands. Thomas's life has changed. Peter, the denier, he goes and forgives him on the beach. Peter's life is changed. Mary Magdalene's life is changed. All, all these stories start to come out of Jesus is back from, from the dead. But here's the problem. Right now, today, we're like, eh, maybe, maybe. Like the arguments sometimes, they get quite, quite, quite logical. They'll be like, well, actually... The women, because they're women, on the way to the tomb, they probably got lost and went to the wrong tomb. You know how women are. They're like going to the tomb, they ended up at Target, right? <laughs> right? They got lost. You know, girls, they just got distracted. They got lost. Or they'll be like, the, the, the disciples were just hallucinating. This is my favorite one. They'll be like, Jesus faked his death. He's with Biggie and Tupac and <laughs> Elvis and Michael Jackson, Right? They have them, right? And so, <laughs> see, because this part's important. And here's always my question with people: like, think about the the logic of of what you're saying. Like the logic of saying the, 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 the disciples. Like some people say the, the disciples just hid his body. They hid his body, and they've hidden it for 2,000 years, and we've never found it, right? He died in Jerusalem. He was buried in Jerusalem, and then they said he was resurrected in Jerusalem, and they started the church in Jerusalem. It's not like they went 1,000 miles across the world and were like, hey, back in a land you've never been, in a language you've never heard, of a God you've never seen. They went to the same city and said, the God that you put on a cross and you saw was placed in a tomb is back. They have nothing to gain. I mean, some people are like, well, you know, they, they got position. You know, you know, every disciple, every one of them that began to share this message ultimately would die for this message. Peter would get crucified upside down. John would get burned alive. It didn't work, so they just exiled him to the island of Patmos. This guy, Paul, he would get beheaded by Nero. He, he literally, uh, he, 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 he got, a, he got a, um, a meeting with Nero. This is how popular Christianity, how influential it became in just 60 years after, the, after the, the resurrection of Jesus. And he would get a meeting with Nero and have a chance to recount, right? You don't stop sharing this. And he said, for me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. What are the implications? Because here, here's the thing about it. All you got to do if you don't want to believe in Jesus, find his body. You you find his body, and all you have is an idiot on a stage yelling at you right now. All all you have is a fake religion. All all you got to do is produce the bones of Jesus. All you got to do is go back to Jerusalem, go find the tomb. You know, here's where he died. They can show you where he died. Here's where we think the tomb was. All you got to do is find, find the body, but the problem is they never have. And the reason they can't find the bones is because Jesus is not here anymore. Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and on the third day he rose in power. And it changes everything. That's what Paul says. Watch what he says in 1 Corinthians. He keeps going. He says this. It's so important. He says, and if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and so is our faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, here's what actually happened, they've perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, why does this matter? Well, here's number one. If Jesus rose, let me just give you three quick. If Jesus rose, then here's the first thing. There's power to overcome. Can I get it? Amen? Okay, there's power to live a different life. 
There, there, there's power to have addictions broken. There's power for your, your, your marriage literally right now can be falling apart. But if Jesus rose from the dead, if he died, he was placed in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose in power. And he changed just like that. He overcame just like that. Then just one moment in God's presence can change everything about your marriage. Amen. There, there's power to overcome. But if he has it, all you have is a dude yelling at you right now. Let me get the piano going and manipulate your emotions, right? Let me, let me, just, let me just yell at you. I have nothing to give you, give you if Jesus didn't come back from the dead. I mean, it would be like this. Uh, um, cancer is a pretty, 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 pretty important thing that we deal with in our culture, and it's pretty crucial. And I'm a pastor. And that's all that I got. Like, if, I, if you want me to help you do anything else, I can't. And so uh, I'm a pastor. I went to school to be a pastor. I have a, I have a degree. It sits in Limerick on a, in, a, in, a, in a closet. It's framed. I have two degrees. I don't know what the first one was for, but they gave me two. And so um, <laughs> you get one after two years. I don't know what they give it to you for, but they're like, hey, good job, right? And so it's like a participation trophy. And then you get... And then you get the real one. And so I have two. I have a bachelor's of arts for something, something, something. And then it says you can be a pastor. And so, and that's what I have. And those two, those two frames, they sit in Limerick in a closet. I kid you not. I spent all this money at Hobby Lobby 2002, <laughs> put them on my, my wall and displayed them. And then now they're in Limerick and I, forget, I found out nobody cares. And so, um, and that's what I am. And so let's just say you got cancer. And you came to me and you were like, I need your help. I don't need prayer though. I need you to tell me how to... Um, to do this. I need, I need some medicine. And I was like, I got you. And I was like, here, look at, my, look, at my, look at my degrees. I have a Bachelor of Science, and so I can probably figure this out with you. You'd be like, I want you to pray with me, not try to heal me. I need a doctor for that. Right? Like, there, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing for me in this situation for me, for me to offer you. And this is what it's like. You come into this room, and you need help, and you're desperate, you're hopeless. I, let's just be honest. Not everybody in this room got their life together. Can I get an amen? amen. Some of you are like, you, you, you have it together, but you have only really had it together since you got to church today. Let's be honest. Let's just, you were yelling and cursing and all that stuff, right? Like, we, we were there today. Me and my wife got in a fight on the way to church today. That's just the way that it goes. We fought in the drive through to Dunkin' Donuts, right? And so we fought over ordering coffee. I get a coffee with cream just coffee with cream and then she orders and she can't just give me her whole order because I can't handle it all at once and so <laughs> she's like, I'm gonna take a decaf coffee with almond milk and sugar-free vanilla and I'm like can you just tell me the whole thing you can't do it and so we're fighting and she said to me she said Jesus has risen right like that <laughs> so we don't got it all, 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 all going all together all the time right there's things that God is, is, is working on in, in, in our lives. And if, if you came here and you were expecting to get something from somebody who has it all together, let me just give you some advice. I got nothing. In fact, there's times where people talk to me about things that they're going through that I'm like, we're going to have to reschedule this meeting. I'm going to have to go see Jesus about this, right? And so, he, But here's what I, I always have because Jesus, he died. He was placed in the tomb on the third day. He rose in power. And the Bible says if he rose in power, that there, if, if he can overcome the grave, then there is nothing in your life that with his help you can't overcome. Amen. You're not a product of your past. You're not a victim of your situation. You're not stuck with what's been said and done to you. There's a new law working in your life. You know what I'm talking about? Like there's always laws working. Like uh, if I jump, I jump and I try to get high, right? Just jump. What's, what's the law that's going to pull me back down? The law of gravity, right? Some of you, you defy it, but he, even Mike, my, Mike will jump and eventually he comes back down, right? And so, like, it's the law of gravity. And so for years, like, that, that was, we were grounded, right? And then some brothers came along. I think it was the brothers that came along and, and uh, they began to, to work in, 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 is it aerodynamics or whatever it is? I don't know what it is. And so, and they, they began to dream about putting this big, this big, heavy, capsule death capsule in the air with with, with wings and and there, even though the law of gravity is going on they, they study i mean could you imagine in that time they're like hey we're gonna put people up in the air right it's gonna be fine you're gonna fly you're not gonna die how fast you're gonna go faster than that horse right and so everybody's going no there's a law the law of gravity and they come up with new new law in fact first service i asked them what it is i don't even know what the law is anybody know what the law was Aerodynamics, I don't know if that's it or not. I said aerodynamics, somebody texted me, you're an idiot. That's not what it is, and so I don't know. <laughs> All I know is there was a law of gravity, and then they defeated that law with a better law. Amen? Amen? 
There's, there's a law working in your life. We're going to move on from this illustration. There's a law working in your life that says you're a victim. You can't move on. You can't do this. You can't overcome. You got to be angry. You got to be bitter. You're always going to be a prisoner of your past or a product of your, of your situation. And there's a greater law at work. There's a law of freedom. There's a law of hope. There's a law of restoration. There's a law where you can be born again. You ever hear Jesus say that you got to be born again? That means all the garbage and, and all the bad influence and all the negative words that have affected your life, that Jesus can become greater than all those in you. That you have the power to overcome. Let me just give you, let me give you two more as we bring this in for a landing. Ian, you can come play, play me out so I preach faster. Number two. We want to sing a little more. Can we do that? It's gospel day. We've got to sing a little more. You've got to sing with me this time. And so if Jesus rose, here's another one. If Jesus rose, there's forgiveness of sin. So he, here's, here's, here's such a stupid thing about religion. Now, I know this is 930 service. And I, like, so, so when I, some of you are like, what does that mean? Okay, so 930 service, so we're going to do four services. And 8 o'clock is like, they're, just, they're early, they're type A, get it get done, right? We've got plans. We're going to work out after this before we eat, like all this stuff, right? <laughs> 9.30 is like, this, like the, that's like the hour. Everybody comes to church. Like if you're going to be a visitor, go at 9.30. It feels safe, right? And so 11 o'clock, bro, you got to see them. And so just the way it is. And then we're going to have a 12. We don't even know what to expect at 12.30. And so it uh, could be crazy. Could, nobody could be here. We don't know what's going to happen. And so we've never done a 12.30 service. And so, but 9.30 service can be like the vanilla service. Like, it's just vanilla. Like, it's just, we're going to get in, get out, do our service, get our picture, see the Easter bunny, get our eggs, go home. It's religion. Can I tell you how much I hate religion? Re religion is like having insurance um, for something that's never going to happen. <laughs> Sounds like all insurance. I have insurance. For what? I don't know. My grandma's grandma, grandma did this, so we do this. Why did you get baptized? I don't know. Just, we're just, this is our, what we do. This is our religion. It's just, what? You think Jesus came to start religion? You think Jesus came to give us a new set of rules? Jesus never said, come and follow my rules. Have you ever, can you find that? He never said, here's some good teachings for you that'll lead to life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Simple as that. Here's why you can't get to the Father through religion. Because religion doesn't make you better. Religion just makes you confused. Let me explain your state to you, 930 service. When you were born... You came into this world and you began what is known as becoming an expert in sinning. Just the way it is. You don't think you're an expert in sinning? As a parent, begin to view your kids. Tell them no, see what they do. Tell them they can't have candy today. When they get in that car and they've already had 16 pieces, because you know they've already eaten some. And you're like, no, you can't have any other candy because I have good food for you. I hate my life. And from the moment that we're born, we begin this, this, this selfish act. It's me, it's me, it's me. And we begin to fill our life with sin. It goes to deeper stuff. We, we begin to fill our life with bitterness, with anger, with resentment, uh, hatred, um, lust, gossip. Ooh, let me talk about that one for a second at a 930 service. Judgmental. And we fill our life with sin. And the Bible talks about sin um, separating us from God. It says this. It says the wages of sin is death and hell. Now that doesn't preach to our culture. But I'm going to be honest with you today because this might be the only time I ever talk to you. For as much as I believe that heaven is real, I also believe there's a place called hell. For as much as I have um, built my life on the desire to share the gospel of Jesus... I also believe that there's a message of Satan. I believe he wants to kill, he wants to steal, he wants to destroy. I think he wants to confuse. I think he wants you to believe this whole thing is fake. I think he wants you to keep living the lies that, that you're living. But sin just leads to more sin. And the Bible says that sin grows in our life and eventually brings death. 
Bible also talks about how it's a, it's a scary thing to, to die in sin and fall into the hands of a holy God. So here's what God could have done with you in your religion. He could have laughed. That's stupid. He could have wiped his hands with you. You don't listen to me. Do what you want. He could have watched you wander. And here's what he did instead. The Bible says that while you are still a sinner, that he sent his son Jesus Christ to this earth to die on a cross for your sins. That before you were thinking of him, he was thinking of you. That as you've run, he's pursued. That as you've said no, he's been confident enough in his Godship to not get offended by your no, to keep knocking at the door of your heart and see if today of the day is the day you'll say yes. You see, if Jesus came back from the dead, the Bible says that not only did he, did he give us the power to overcome, but he paid the price of our sin in full, past, present, and future. I'm free today. I, I don't need to struggle with my sin. I don't need to carry my past. I, I, don't, I don't need to look in the mirror and be in shame. It doesn't mean that I don't deserve those things, because I certainly do. But when I see myself, instead of seeing who I am, I see Jesus. When God sees me, instead of seeing me for who I am, he sees Jesus. Let me just give you one more thought. Here's, my, here's, my, here's, the, here's the good news. And so some, this is, this is uh, like present news. There's power to forgive your sins. There's power to overcome. And then the third thing that, that we see in Scripture, if Jesus rose from the dead, then there is the promise of eternal life. So uh, I'm a pastor. I'm always around death. It's part of my job. And uh, the one thing I've learned from people with, with, with death is they're, they're really weird with it. Like they just make up stuff. It makes them feel better. Right? They'll be like, my, 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 my mom died, my dad died, my uncle died. I can feel them with me. I'm like, what? Or they'll be like, they went to heaven and they got their wings. I'm like, what the heck is that? They're my guardian angel. I'm like, no, it doesn't say that in the Bible. I'm sorry. They're in a better place. I'm like, what, what's that? The dirt they're in? What are we talking about? Like, this, all these things make us feel better, right? So Paul says, listen, if Jesus is in the tomb still, and we're sharing this message, right? Oh, Jesus can change you. But he's still in the tomb. He says, we should be more pitied than anyone else. Because we're wasting our entire life. This is all we have right now. This is it. This, the next 15 years or 20 years or 30 years, this is all we have. And then it's over. And we're wasting our life believing a lie. But if Jesus rose in power, no matter if I live 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, no matter if this is my last Sunday on this earth, that if Jesus came back from the dead, the Bible says he was the first fruits. He defeated sin. He defeated death. He rose in power. The Bible says that he ascended to the right hand of God in a place of authority. He intercedes for you and me, and he awaits us to come home. And Paul said, when I take my last breath on this earth, no matter what it looks like on this earth, my next breath will be with Jesus Christ in heaven forever. Which is why he was in a prison. And they said, just stop preaching about Jesus. He said, I already live without Jesus. I follow religion. I try to make it on my own. He said, for me now, because of Jesus, if I live, it's going to be for Jesus. But if I die, it's gain because I get to go to be home with him. And I just... For some of you, you're so terrified of life and so terrified of what's to come and so anxiety-ridden and all that stuff. So if you could get the implications of the empty tomb and the eternal life, what do we have to be afraid of? Nobody can kill my soul. Nobody can stop God's plan for my life. Nobody can erase my name, the Bible says, from the Lamb's book of life. Now when I'm done here, that I fully understand that my real home is in heaven. This message could change your life. It's not a complying message. It's never been about compliers. It's always been about rebels. It's always been about outcasts. It's always been about doubters. It's always been about people who thought it couldn't be real and then they come into the presence of God and something changes in their life and forever they're changed. It's always been about the hopeless getting hope. It's always been about the broken being restored. It's always been about the lost being found. And that same Jesus, he's here right now. He's risen. His presence is here. He's knocking at the door of people's hearts. Come on, let's not have a normal 
9.30 Easter service. Let's let the Lord do what he wants to do over the next few moments. Amen? Would you stand to your feet? Would you bow your heads and would you close your eyes? Let me just ask you. The message of Jesus is real. You don't have to believe it. I want you to think about um, the paradigm in the very beginning. You have the cross. You have The Bible says the three men are crucified. You have the cross. Jesus is on it. And there's two thieves, on one on each side. They both deserve death. They both see Jesus. I want you to see it in your head. Heads bowed and eyes closed. And they begin to mock him. Maybe like you. You walk into church. You want to mock this. Make fun of him. You're on the cross. You think you're God. What are you doing, man? If you're God, get off this cross and get us off too. And something happens to one of the thieves. He begins to listen to Jesus. He's speaking to his father. He's, he's praying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's committing his spirit. He's taking on the sins of the world. He's carrying the weight of having his father begin to turn his back on him and feel the weight of sin and feel the weight of sorrow in his life. And one of the thieves in that moment recognizes something. Oh my gosh, this is the son of God. He's never going to get off that cross. He's, he's not going anywhere. He can't go get baptized. He can't go sign up for church. But he's on the cross. He deserves death. He looks to Jesus. And he says, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. Real simple. He says, today will you remember me when you go to paradise, when you go to heaven. And Jesus says, today, today I'm going to remember you. You have a place with me. No religion. No reading scripture after that. Here's Jesus. I see him. Jesus Christ, be my Lord and my Savior. I think that that paradigm is here. you got a room full of people. Some people know Jesus. You've, you've gazed on the cross. You've seen the resurrection. You are fully believing. And then some of us, we're, we represent one of those two thieves. Some of us are mocking. We don't care. We don't want to do this. we got our own way to live. But there's other people in this place that you, for the first time, have gazed at the work of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news. The Bible is really clear with the good news. Everyone's sins fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death and hell, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For anyone who calls on the name of Jesus shall be saved. For if you would confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that he would meet you right there in that moment. He would forgive you, he would heal you, and he would make you whole. It's faith. But here's the thing about it. We think about faith. It's not faith to believe that Jesus did that. That's common sense. You can't argue that. He died. It's accurate. It's historical. He was placed in a tomb. That's true. And they've never found his body. And so you can believe that they just need to search some more. Or you can come to the same conclusion that many of us have come to. He came back in power. And because of that, there's power in my life to overcome. There's forgiveness of sins. There's the promise of eternity. I have to say yes to Jesus. Faith is not believing that. Faith is accepting that and walking out of this place in obedience. That's faith. I'm going to turn my life to Jesus, and I'm never going to turn away from him again. If that's you all over this place, I don't know Christ, but I want to. I want to lead you in a simple prayer, same prayer we've been praying for years in this church. Not a long prayer, not an eloquent prayer, just a simple prayer. Jesus Christ, on this Easter 2024, I'm going to put my faith in you. I believe you can help me to overcome. I got addiction. I got brokenness. I got hurt. I got shame. Jesus Christ, you're the overcomer. Jesus Christ, I'm filled with sin. I believe you can heal me, forgive me, make me whole. You're going to forgive my sins as far as the east is from the west. Jesus Christ, I'm struggling with anxiety. I'm afraid of life. I want to live life and life to the full. I want the promise of eternity in my life right now. I want to live anxiety free. I want to be filled with trust and hope and faith. That's you all over this place. You would say, hey pastor, that's me. Nobody's looking around. I'm not going to call you forward. I want to lead you in a prayer though. I want to lead you in a simple prayer. Jesus Christ, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. Come on, 930 service. All over this place. If that's you, would you just begin to shoot your hand straight towards heaven? I don't know Jesus Christ, but I need to. I see a hand right here. Is there anybody else? I don't know Jesus Christ, but I need to. There's another hand right here. Is there anybody else? Would you pray something like this as the, as the band and the choir come back and say, Jesus Christ, today I put my faith and my hope in you. 
I know you died on the cross for my sins and you rose in power. And because of that message, I'm a brand new person. I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm saved, and I'm set free. In Jesus' name we, I pray. Everybody shout amen. Come on, let's clap together. Thank you so much for being a part of Easter Music Festival. We'd love for you to join us in person next Sunday at our Phoenixville or Montgomeryville locations. To get information on how to join us, what it's like to have a relationship with Jesus, or if you have any questions, visit our website at jrny.church or follow us on social media. We can't wait to see you soon. Thank you.